I on? There I am. Okay. Before I give the sermon, a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. Uh, number one is uh, I will not be here next week. I have a previous speaking engagement before I took this uh, honor of this position. So um, if I'm not here, it's not because I don't like you, okay? <laughs> oh. Second, I would request that you have a little talk with Jesus because I'm set for jury duty on the 18th of, of July, which is during Vacation Bible School. And I can't be here for all of that anyway. So if you can pray that the Sunday night before they say, we don't want you. It would be the wonderful, most wonderful we don't want you I've had in a long, long time. So just letting you know, if I'm not here that week, I will be busy. And finally, we often say happy Sabbath, and I enjoy the Sabbath too. But worship is really, first and foremost, about God. So before we go any farther, can we say praise God together? That's why we're here, right? Okay, praise God. That's pretty good. I think we need to do that a little more often too. I've asked Jerry to read a very beautiful and deep passage of Scripture. At, as we begin this message. Before that, though, just want to share a word of grace to all the saints in Laguna Niguel who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace and peace to you from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. And he humbled himself even further, going so far as actually to die a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus did what? Jesus did what? You may say, Pastor Gary, why would you even ask that question? Well, believe me, that question was asked about Jesus many, many times during his life and ministry on earth. The Pharisees asked it all the time. Jesus did what? He touched a leper? Jesus did what? He touched a woman? Jesus did what? He ate with sinners? Jesus did what? He broke the Sabbath? It was a common question that was said. Even the disciples asked that question. Are you aware of that? I mean, it's nowhere in the Bible, but you, you can't help but read between the lines. Jesus, why are you waiting to go see Lazarus? What are you thinking? Jesus, why are you going to Jerusalem? They want to kill you there. And if we're going to be really honest with ourselves as we go through life, haven't there been times when you've asked the question, Jesus, what are you doing right now? My life has questions. My life is in shambles. My life has anxiety. Why, Jesus? There's been a phrase for a number of years that says we should ask the question, what would Jesus do? And, and that's a good question. If the disciples had asked that, they would never have had a clue what Jesus was going to do, would they? Maybe the more appropriate question is, what does Jesus want me to do? Because he didn't act the same way in, in similar situations every single time. Jesus, what do you want me to do today? Last week, if you were here, you heard the message, God's goal for our, your life. And we discovered that that message is really about, go ahead and change it, please. That message is really about 
becoming more Christ-like. Becoming more Christ-like. If we could move the slide, please. Not working? Okay. We're going without that unless they can cheat. Okay. It, it, and we, we read a quote, and, and it's really God's goal is that we become more Christ-like. And I read a quote from Max Lucado that says, God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. He wants you to be just like Jesus. And we discovered that the reason Jesus was able to live his life and ministry and minister to others as he did was, first of all, because prayer empowered Jesus' life and ministry. Secondly, it was love and compassion were the motives for his life and ministry. Third, that he was always inviting people to know the Father. That was the message of his life and ministry, the primary message. And finally, serving others was the method of his life and ministry. And today we're going to look at perhaps the supreme example of Jesus serving others as the method of his life and ministry and apply it to our lives. And a reminder of the picture that Isaiah says that God is the potter and we are the what? Clay. That he is the one who molds and shapes us and fashions us and transforms us so that we can become more like who? More like who? More like Jesus. The scripture that was read today, we're going to look at it once more. It's Philippians 2, 5 to 8, and I don't normally use paraphrased versions when I preach, but the Message Bible put this in such clear way that it leaves no room for doubt as to what we believe. It says, think of yourselves, and I'm going to pause and make comments as we go. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. There are three paradoxes we're going to look at this morning. And for those who may not, maybe the children or youth will know what a paradox is. Most of us do. A paradox are two events or, or two things that have content that really don't look like they belong together, but they're absolutely true. And the first paradox that we will notice and speak briefly about is the paradox of the incarnation. How could God enter and become part of human flesh and still remain God? I don't have an answer to that. Do you? And if you shake your head yes, come on up. Because you've got some information I've never heard before. That's the first paradox, the incarnation. The second paradox is found in the remaining verse. Having become human, he stayed human. He lived his life as a human being, not as God. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless life, obedient life, and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. The second paradox, and just to clarify, Jesus did not die as God. Deity can't die. What happened to Jesus as God at that part of his, of his incarnation during that time, we don't know. He died as a human being. But think about this. The one who gave life, the giver of life, became a human being, and that human being died the most cruel death. And then we'll spend the rest of our time on the third paradox. It's found in John chapter 13. I want to read the beginning of those verses. 
it says, and this is from the New International Version the, from 1984. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Now listen carefully to this next verse. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. What's interesting is when you look at this, all four aspects of how Jesus lived his life in ministry are found in this story. I want you to notice, it says twice, Jesus knew. He knew the time had come for him to leave this world. It says Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and he was going to return to God soon. Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot had already betrayed him. How did he know those things? He could only know those things because of the time he had spent in prayer with the Father. I want you to notice the love and compassion. Verse 2, I'm sorry, verse, verse 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Most translations say he loved them to the end. And the question people raise is the end of what? The end of their lives? Well, of course. The end of his life, he's going to die on the cross? Well, he loved them beyond that. I think this translation really, because the, the word end really means complete. He loved them completely. He showed them the full extent of his love. And he would do that through what's going to happen next. I'm going to ask you to set aside what you already know about this story, if, if that's possible. I know that's asking a lot. I want to go back and revisit verse 3. I want to remind you that when the disciples heard Jesus, the, the disciples had in mind a Messiah who would come and rid them of the Romans. They had in mind a disciple who would one day show up at the temple in, in, in glorious fashion and who would raise Israel to, to new heights far beyond even that of David and Solomon. The disciples had in mind a, a Messiah who would come and, and make them part of his, his inner circle so that they could rule people along with him. The disciples had in mind an earthly Messiah who would bring grand and glorious things to God's people and they would be part of it. I want you to think in terms of knowing that part. If you read verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Now notice this part. Jesus knew that he had come from God and was returning to God. If you were to complete that sentence without knowing what comes next, what would you say? I, I think from a human perspective, we would say things like, Jesus knew that he had come from God and he was going back to God and he was going to let the Pharisees know they were wrong. Jesus knew that he'd come from God and he was going back to God and Jesus was going to help the disciples get their act together. He did it, but not in that manner. I mean, there's probably all kinds of ways you could say it, but the paradox comes in what takes place next. And I'm going to read it from John 13, verses 4 to 5. And so he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, wrapped up a, a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them around him, wrapped, wrapped around him. He picked up a towel, took a basin, and knelt before every single one of them, including Judas, who would betray him, including Peter, who would deny him, including the disciples who would abandon him, and even including John, who, even though he was at the cross, had no clue what it was all about. He took a towel. We need to remember that when Jesus did this, the disciples were still in conflict. The disciples were still arguing about with each other. They were still upset at, at James and John for having their mother ask Jesus, 
Jesus, when you come in your glory, can you ask the Father to, that one of us can be at your right hand and one at your left? Can, can you treat us more special than you treat others? Jesus, that's up to my Father. You don't know what you're asking. It's going to be a painful process. The rest of the disciples were indignant. They may not have even been speaking to each other much at this point. Now, Jesus had asked the disciples to prepare a room for him. And they had. And people, when they went to a feast, they, they would take their baths and then they would put on their sandals and walk to wherever they were going through the streets of Jerusalem. And there was usually a servant there at a feast. And the role of this servant, the lowliest of servants, usually a slave, the role of the servant was to wash the disciples' feet. For many years, I thought, what's the big deal? A little bit of dust. Think about the streets of Jerusalem in Jesus' time. It wasn't just people who walked the streets. It's camels donkeys, horses, perhaps sheep. I don't think they had a sanitation department to pick it up. They've got stuff on their feet. It could not be avoided. No wonder the disciples didn't want to wash each other's feet. Keep that in mind. Not only that, <clears throat> culturally, to kneel before someone at their feet was considered an act of servitude. Here is the one they think is going to be the Messiah doing such a menial slave task and doing it willingly. And then Peter, Jesus comes to Peter. And I'm going to read John 13, 6 to 17. Just listen. I know you know the story. I'm going to interrupt the story with some thoughts. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said, no, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Some translations say you will not belong to me. Peter caught what Jesus was saying, and it cut him to the, his heart. And so he, he went from one extreme to another, as Peter often did. He said, then, Lord, not just my feet, but wash my hands and my head as well. And I really believe Jesus at least had to smile and maybe even chuckled when he heard Peter going to that extreme. And he said, Jesus answered, but Peter, come on. A person who's had a full bath only needs only to have his feet washed because his whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. The lesson and the implication and lesson is clear. He wasn't just talking about the, his physical bath and his physical feet. He was talking about his spiritual bath, baptism, and his spiritual feet. Right? He said, you've been cleansed, <coughs> but just as walking in the streets of Jerusalem have made your feet offensive so that you don't want to wash each other's feet, so your feet, spiritual feet, that have become dirty from the sins you've committed since your baptism. They're just as gross to our Heavenly Father as your physical feet are to you. Right? And so Jesus washed their feet. And when he had finished washing their feet. He put on his clothes, his outer clothes, returned to his place. And he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now, verse 14, though, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed or happy if you do them. Some of you may be wondering, Pastor Gary, it's not communion today. Why are we talking about foot washing? Partly because we rarely mention it other than now and then at a communion service because it's not mentioned all the time. Partly because COVID has kept us from that for a long, for somewhat period of time. I know you've done it since then, but, and we tend to forget it. Partly because things have changed somewhat since I grew up. When I grew up, partly because, you know, at that point, women wore stockings and, and garters and dressed in dresses to go to church. And so women were always in one section, men in another. Somewhere about the time I got to high school or college, someone came up with the idea of husbands and wives serving each other. And I think that's a great thing. I've, I've seen weddings where the husband and wife do a, commu- a foot washing together. And it's a beautiful thing. But as it's progressed, it seems as if more and more the husbands and wives and children are just doing it as a family and we don't do it much with each other anymore. And I think we're losing something by doing that. My wife and I have a practice that at least every other time we wash someone other than feet other than ourselves. I'd like to suggest you try that. But there's other reasons why I chose to speak about it today. The foot washing service is to accomplish three things. First, it is a cleansing from sin. And I've heard people say, wait a minute, when we were baptized, your sins were washed away, past, present, future. That's, that's true. I don't think we need to have our feet washed to remind God to wash away our sins. I think we need to have our feet washed to remind us that he's done it. When you were baptized, he'd already forgiven you your sins that you'd committed before that, right? And baptism was just a way of, of helping remind you and others that God c- cleanses you from sin. And he'll continue to do that. Julie talked about in the children's story that we need to forgive ourselves. And sometimes forgiving ourselves is the hardest person we have to forgive. And I think the foot washing service allows that to take place where we can confess our sins and to forgive it and ask forgiveness. And what's interesting is that for many years, most of the time I was growing up, very few churches did foot washing other than the Adventist church, Disciples of Christ Church. But now you go online, you'll see all kinds of churches doing it. And some of them, just the priest or, or the bishop washes everyone's feet. But I want you to notice it's a a symbol of cleansing from sin. Secondly, it's a symbol that we have the heart of a servant. It's a symbol that we have the heart of a servant. I've had people say to me, you know, that's kind of old-fashioned. Why why do we do that? I mean, it doesn't mean the same anymore. Our feet aren't dusty. Well, if it's not that big a deal, why is it such a big deal? (laughs) Do you get my point? If it's not such a big deal to wash someone's feet, why are you making a big deal that you can't participate in it? But I I, want to share a story with you of something that happened to me way back in 1972 when I was a junior in college. And all the kids are going, he really is old. And the young adults saying, yeah, he's old. So I was a junior in college in 1972. I was religious vice president at Andrews, Andrews University. In the spring, they had a meeting with all the the student association uh, officers from all the colleges in North America. And I went. And they just talked about what they were doing in their, in their schools and, and things that were important to them and, and getting to know other kids from other, uh, other young people from other colleges. And then they ended with a communion service. 1972, got the year? It was in Texas, got the place? So I'm standing there wondering who I'm going to participate with and a professor from Oakwood College, Dr. Smith, that was his name, 
His brother was Dr. Reger Smith at Andrews, so I knew his brother. I don't remember his first name. Dr. Smith came up to me and said, do you mind if I wash your feet? I said, of course not. He said, I have a, a tradition, a personal tradition. I always pray with the person before I wash their feet. Can I do that? I said, yes. So he prayed for me. He prayed for me in my future. He prayed for me in my spiritual journey. He prayed for me as a leader at the school. And after he was done, I had prayer with him. And there has never, ever been a foot washing service that has not been meaningful and has not been something I look forward to because of that practice. And so I always ask someone, is there something I can pray for for you? either your physical life, your spiritual life, or whatever. And every single foot washing service is meaningful because of it. He had a servant's heart. But that's not all. Yes, it's a cleansing from sin. Yes, it's a servant's heart. But it's also an opportunity to reconcile with brothers or sisters we need to reconcile with. In Matthew Five during this in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 23, Jesus said, if you are offering your gift at the altar, speaking about monetary offering or a sacrifice of a lamb, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. At the foot washing service in that communion, you are offering your gift of yourself to God. Do you catch that? At the foot washing service in the communion, you are offering yourself as a gift to God. And Jesus said, if you have something against your brother or your brother has something against you, leave your gift of yourself. First go and be reconciled to them. One of the reasons I chose this passage is we're not having communion until the end of the, of the month. I'll be gone next week. The week after that is vacation Bible school. I wanted to give a sermon on the foot washing to have you thinking about and preparing for that event. Asking God, whose feet do I need to wash that Sabbath? Who am I at odds with that I need to serve that Sabbath? I also have another practice before every communion service. I go to the book Desire of Ages and I read chapters 71 and 72. Chapter 71 is on the foot washing and it's called Servant of Servants. And chapter 72 is called In Remembrance of Me. And in that chapter on Remembrance of Me, Ellen White states, and I see this all the time in communion services, we, we almost make it a solemn okay, and it needs to be solemn, don't misunderstand me, but it needs to be a celebration of what Jesus has done for us. And in, in that chapter, she says that the communion service is not to be a, a season of sorrowing for sin because the sorrowing for sin has taken place during foot washing. But we are now to come, and we are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. And so when we do communion on July 29th, I believe it is, I'm going to be looking for some smiles on people's faces. I'm going to be looking for people who are praising God for what Jesus Christ has done for us because he counted equality with God not something to cling to, but he emptied himself of his divine prerogatives and he came as a slave. He came as a slave so that you and I could become his sons and daughters and so that you and I can become brothers and sisters in Christ. What did Jesus do? Jesus gave us an example of 
of the power of serving others so that we might become more like him.